Welcome back to the online Bible study. Last week I concluded by taking the first verse of James 4 for continuity purposes and it read what is causing quarrels and fights among you and we noted that the source of that was the inner battle and we looked at the source being a certain degree of carnality that was stopping the flow and work of the Holy Spirit. So taking that as the lead uh, into our study, we can see that James is going to deal with the inward spiritual health that determines our outward actions and reactions in life. So we're going to pick up at verse 2. You, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Well, obviously there is something very wrong going on for James to write so directly and so sharply. And of course, there was something very wrong happening. Old habits die hard. And uh, James has to bring guidance to the Jewish believers that were still living in their ancient habits, in a way. The Old Testament, you will notice, um, is full of... Uh, wars and uh, violence killings and slaughters you can't avoid it it's there um, they're not uncommon in the old testament they often are hard for us to read in the context of the new testament revelations that we have and the message of peace and grace so reading some parts of the old testament uh, really can be quite a struggle uh, we need to remember here that james is writing to the Jews and found himself having to remind them that the old ways are no more and uh, they need to grow they need to grow in grace they need to grow in God they need to grow in their new experience of being saved through Christ and not harp back to the old yesterday ways and he's dealing with a, an, a problem that's so ingrained that it was just like habit for them to be aggressive and they were really not flowing in the grace of God uh, it would take a whole different study really um, to delve back into the Old Testament practices and problems that the Jews um, had and so we'll have to stick to realizing uh, times have changed uh, new ways had to be adopted uh, they had to be fostered and uh, birthed in, in the believer so that the new life in Christ could manifest itself in the church. So that's the kind of feeling to what James is now saying. So um, James says this in, in chapter 4, verses 2 through 3. You, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what you want to spend it on your pleasure. And that word pleasure translates as lust. You only want it to fulfill your lusts. And now, James uses a word that's very, very powerful. He says, uh, you are adulterers. That's a strong word for James to use, but he needs to remind them of something and he has to hit them hard with it and bring out the truth. He has to remind them that God passionately loves them and the way they were conducting themselves and business and how they were treating other people and how they were living their lives, they were flirting with the world. James sees it as an adultery he sees the passion of God for the people. He sees how much God loves them. And he looks to the people and he sees them playing footloose and fancy free with the ways of the world. And he says, this is adultery. It is cheating on God. And I think that's such a strong way that James deals with the issue by reminding them the old ways have gone Yesterday is past. This is a new day of grace in Christ. And you're living in old practices and you are doing it for the wrong reasons. 
And therefore, your new experience in Christ is really not gelling with what the way that you're living. And James says that if they foster a friendship, and he uses the word friendship, if they foster a friendship with the world, they will actually become enemies of God. And that's quite a strong thing for him to have to say. It was very needy that he brought their attention to it, but it is still very strong. The word friendship um, might sound not so bad if it's used in the way that we would commonly think of it. I have friends. I hope you have friends. We value friendship. We don't see the word friendship as something obnoxious. It's, it's a kind and helpful kind of word to be friend and to be friendly. But the word that he uses is philia, and it comes from an extra extrapolation of the word philios. And it denotes intimacy. Now, that word friendship takes on a whole new meaning. He says you are too intimate with the world. And you are like adulterers in a marriage relationship with God. Now we've got a very different picture. James is saying that they're living completely away from the commitment that they should have with God. They're not living in a way that says they are completely and utterly devoted to God. They are footloose and fancy free, as I said. But only use God when it suits them, when they want something, when they're after something. And they don't get it because God knows the state of the heart. All their motives are corrupt and extremely wrong. And so they, he says, you're not getting what you ask for and you're blaming God for that. But it's actually you because your motives are wrong. Now we come to a very um, significant section of this part of James. Um, it's verses 7 through 10. Uh, <clears throat> he says these words, uh, Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honour. That's a really hard message to hear. And it seems rather... Um, rather strong words that he uses. Wash you, your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Cry instead of laughing. Let deep grief overwhelm you. Exchange sadness for your often bouts of laughter. Have gloom instead of joy. It doesn't seem to fit the wonderful experience of a new life in Christ Jesus. And it might seem that James is really pushing it a little bit too far. But in fact, he's not. He says, humble yourselves. I need to take you to build this picture up to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Did you, did you catch that? This is in the way back when of the Old Testament. But this is the, the words of Samuel. He says, listen, do you think God has any real delight in offering of burnt offerings of, of uh, sacrifices. He says, obedience is better than sacrifice. 
We don't need that. James doesn't just leave it uh, at that either um, as a condemnation, but he gives an amazing uh, antidote to the underlying issues of disobedience and self-ambition. He says, resist the devil. Uh, the word that he uses in the, in the Greek is anthistomy, and uh, it means to stand against with force, uh, not to be alongside, uh, but to oppose and to be in the opposite force. And so it is a, you know, sort of a full on face on resistance to the enemy. He says, um, you can't accommodate both. You can't have a little bit of both. It's never going to work. Therefore, we have to stand firm uh, against the devil, but only after humbling oneself to God. And if you do it without that prerequisite, you will find yourself in a whole lot of hot water. A lot of people that I have come across over the years have tried to come against the enemy, but have not prepared themselves by the humbling of the heart before God. You have to humble your heart before God before you can actually come against the enemy. And so the word humble is an interesting word that's used because it means obey. The word that's used means obey. So now we're back to what Samuel was saying. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So you start with obedience. Even before you go into any form of spiritual warfare, you have to have come to the place of a humble place of obedience before God. And then when you stand against the enemy and you see him flee, it is with uh, an instant reaction. Because the word that James uses in the original translates as vanish. He will vanish before you with speed. That's the implications of the words that he uses. But you must humble yourself first, he says. Humble yourself before God. Obey God. And then and only then resist the enemy. And he says, come close to God. And then God will come close to you. I think here the wonder of, uh, of friendship and fellowship with God is really what takes place of the false friendship that he was James was talking about earlier, the, the incorrect friendship, friendship of the world. You need your friendship with God, your intimacy with God, your closeness to God. Then comes the line, as you read through, wash your hands, you sinners. Well, we've done a lot of washing of our hands lately, haven't we? To protect against infection and germs and virus they keep saying to us wash your hands wash your hands wash your hands so we may get um, a little bit into that and think oh well it, it literally means washing one's hands um, but it's actually not a reference to physically washing your hands in some ceremonial fashion that had been a practice but the best meaning of, of that phrase, wash your hands, is um, to make your hand a leading hand. Um, that, that kind of can sound very different and, and disconnected. But if I can explain, um, the washing of your hand means to offer a kind hand, a good hand. Uh, as if you, literally it means as if you were leading a blind person into safety. If you are leading the church, you are an influence. And remember, he spoke about don't be quick to become teachers. He says, if you're going to be leading the church, if you're going to find yourself teaching the scriptures, you need clean hands, you need good motives, you need purification, you need an inner cleansing. You've got to get this right. And um, you've got to have clean the clean hand of guidance 
is what he's saying here. For a little bit more uh, clarity and insight um, on that, we could look at Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generations of those who seek him, who seek your face. You can see that this is not new, but it's renewed in the new experience of uh, salvation in Christ Jesus. Who can ascend to the presence of the Lord? Uh, who can lift up his heart to God? Somebody that has not lifted up his heart to an idol. You need to come with clean hands and pure heart. So you can see the the implications, the, the history and the significance and the importance of what it meant in the new era. You still have to have clean hands. You still have to have good motives. If you're going to lead in any shape or form, he says, you had better do it with a clean hand and a pure heart. So James is encouraging repentance. He uses the word uh, wash, wash your hand, purify your heart, be sorrowful, um, change laughter for sadness, uh, have true regrets. What he's basically saying when he gives that list in short is it's time to repent. Repent. We still use the phrase uh, in the sense that it's used here uh, about washing your hands. Uh, it's not uncommon to use it even uh, all this uh, time on and through many language changes. Uh, you will have come across it. I am going to wash my hands of this and have no more. I'm washing my hands of the whole affair. These are phrases we probably are very familiar with. And it means, and we understand what we mean when we say that. If I say, I I'm washing my hands of it. You know I'm not running to the bathroom to, to wash my hands. I'm saying that is the end of the matter. I will not be dealing with this anymore. And that's what James is saying. He says, wash your hands of it. Wash your hands of this dualism. Wash this, your hands of this uh, dipping into the world and then trying to dip into God. He said it's not working and it never will. So I hope that kind of clarifies that just a little bit. Um, he now turns to judgings uh, in verses 11 through 12. Um, don't speak evil against each other. And uh, he says, dear brothers and sisters, if you, if you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you or not. And you can see that they were saying, well, going to somebody else. You need to do this. The law says this. And they're not practicing it themselves. God alone, he says, who gave the law is the judge. Only God is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? And I think we all, we all understand now that judging somebody else while we are uh, not in the state that we should be in is just masking our own failures by passing uh, the attention to somebody else's failures so that nobody looks at us and he said this practice has got to stop so you can see by now i mean we're in chapter four you can see by now the terrible state of affairs that the church the churches uh, that were in the dispersia um, that had left jerusalem and been scattered abroad you remember that many of them on the run because their lives were threatened um, had slipped back into uh, old ways of judgmentalism and the law and uh, not really walking in grace. Um, again, it, it's not an excuse or a way of uh, distancing ourselves from, from this uh, because we must remember that his readers were converted Jews. So I keep coming back to that, I know, but it's good to, it's good to identify that uh, from time to time as we're reading 
And uh, that must have been uppermost. Of course, it would be uppermost in his thinking. Uh, are we uh, exempt from the law who are not Jews? Well, we're not exempt, but we're certainly not governed by it in the sense of having to fulfill the law. Christ has fulfilled the law, not abolished it. And, and it's very important to, to understand that. Matthew 5 is worth just bringing in here. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets, said Jesus. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth passes away, not one jot or tittle will by any means pass from the law till it is all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men, so shall he be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does the, and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus actually said um, that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Now, we as non-Jews, Gentile believers, Paul never uh, pushed the issues of law onto the Gentiles. But we don't say, oh, we're not under law, we're under grace, and therefore we can do what we like. That's not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is the law of God still exists, but Jesus has fulfilled every part of it. And therefore in Christ, and here's the grace, we receive the blessing that he has procured for us. So we follow him and by the grace of God and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we receive Christ's acceptance of the Father in short Jesus is our Redeemer. Uh, very quickly, Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. I think, I hope, that you might find that rather exciting and forever be grateful for the grace that we have received in Christ. So a quick recap, and then we have to finish, and we'll carry on in the remainder part of uh, chapter 4 next week. He says, it's time, it's time to purify, to stop the way you're living and purify your hearts. You cannot teach and lead with dualism. Clean your hands, change your ways, stop hurting your brothers and sisters. Don't cheat and steal. Come on, back to the faith, the core of our faith in Christ. If you want to see God move, then move in God. We'll pick up on that next week. And uh, I pray you'll have a wonderful week ahead of you. And God bless you.